different than what the chain of command says. Woodward and Costa also report that Milley opened a back channel with his Chinese counterpart. Things may look unsteady, the general said to General Li Zhu Zhang of China just two days after Mr. Trump's supporters stormed the Capitol. This would have been on January 8th. But that's the nature of democracy, Milley continued. General Li, we are 100% steady, everything's fine, but democracy can be sloppy sometimes. Again, Milley's reported words from the book. Let that sink in for a second. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs was so concerned President Trump would use nuclear weapons, he called our enemies to talk about it. In the past, we've heard about Trump administration aides allegedly convincing themselves that drastic measures were necessary to protect America from President Trump. But this is the first time we've heard about a concrete action to potentially violate President Trump's authority as commander in chief. Of all the powers of the president, few are as important as the ability to launch a nuclear strike and thus protect America. All right, more from the book. If you get calls, General Milley said, no matter who they're from, there's a process here, there's a procedure. No matter what you're told, you do the procedure, you do the process, and I'm part of that procedure. You've got to make sure the right people are on the net. Let's look at this a different way. The president is also called the commander in chief. He and he alone can order the use of nuclear weapons. Today, we're learning the chairman of the Joint Chiefs tried to usurp that power in a brazen violation of the law, the military chain of command, and the U.S. Constitution. Or is this an attempt to sell books using breathless headlines about relatively mundane matters? This requires a close examination from all sides of the story. First, is it legal? National security law expert Kevin Carroll studies and writes about things. He's with us in a minute. But we start with Mediate founding editor Colby Hall. All right, Colby, uh, is there a little bit more in the headlines than is actually in the reporting here? Well, it's, it's, you did a great job of setting it up, so kudos to you. But, um, yeah, it's a huge story. And, um, you know, off the top, I haven't read the book, so I'm only based on the same reporting that you've read. Um, but there's a lot going on here. One thing I think that we overlooked is the pretext to all this, and that is that uh, General Milley, who is the most decorated, the most powerful, uh, highest-ranking member of the military, who was appointed by President Trump, you know, he didn't get to that position by being a con man. I mean, he did that because he's intelligent, He's disciplined. Um, he believed that President Trump was unstable, was unhinged. And th that's, that's a story unto itself. Now, the follow-up to that on the sort of nuclear weapons, uh, ostensibly keeping them from the commander in chief, that's a big story. Um, I, I happen to believe, based on what I've read, that he basically said, we need to stick to the process, right? So he wasn't necessarily subverting, in this instance at least, the power of the commander in chief, which is a big deal. He was only saying that uh, you know everyone needs to play it by the book, and we're not going to go rogue, and we're not going to let one person sort of do something that isn't by the book. Which you, I you think cover, you, know, you cover the media, and it's important to sort of parse these words because, as you point out, they're they're so important. Having a meeting and saying follow procedure is very different than having a meeting and saying don't follow uh, a lawful order. This is how CNN initially reported. The book. We want to look at their headline here for a second so you can see it. Woodward Costa book worried Trump could go rogue. Milley took secret action to protect nuclear weapons. You can read the excerpt and think that this was not an action to protect nuclear weapons, but this was an action to remind people of procedure. Well, absolutely right. And it wouldn't be the first time uh, that a headline was written designed to get clicks. And I am personally guilty of that myself. You know, <laughs> if it, uh, we, we, try to, we try to sum up the story in a way that doesn't always serve the truth of the story in its best interest. And I think later, as more, I mean, it was a fluid story at the time, and as more information came out, we know that it was more process-oriented. His dealings, however, with China, I think is a much, much bigger deal than, you know, if it's true that he just insisted that the nuclear codes, the lo potential logic of a nuclear device was go by the process. That seems certainly that passes the smell test to me. Mm. But the, the ongoing conversation with his Chinese, um, you know, counterpart, basically subverting the power and the leadership of the commander in chief, that's a big, big no-no. Um, and I'm not a military expert, but I'm, you know, a layperson can say that if, if we're going to get first, we're going to get to a military be, expert in due course. Your website pointed this out. Um, this was a tweet from Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, uh, made famous as being the whistleblower about President Trump uh, in the Ukraine uh, matter. 
If this is true, General Milley must resign. He usurped civilian authority, broke chain of command, and violated the sacrosanct principle of civilian control over the military. It's an extremely dangerous precedent. You can't simply walk away from that. Uh, do you think Woodward and Bernstein, or sorry, <laughs> Woodward and Costa, uh, understood uh, the significance of what this reporting is and how important it is that it be absolutely accurate when they put it out? Well, I th absolutely. I think they knew that this was the bombshell. Their goal is to sell books. They had this sort of bombshell news story. So, of course, it was the one, I mean, there was really no press or no attention given to this book, Peril, until today. And we learned about it sort of broadly with this sort of leak, this this portion of the book. that went. So that that's an admission that they knew that this was a huge, huge deal. Again, I think that the way that you open the show is exactly right if it proves to be true. That's yeah. the whole thing. And I will add, General Milley is scheduled to appear uh, before the Senate for a hearing about uh, armed services September 28th. And, yeah. and that hearing will be a fascinating I would say thing to watch because that, that, a lot of stuff will come out Yeah, of that. that just became must-see television for uh, all of America uh, for a number of important reasons. Colby, great seeing you as always. Thank you. Leland, thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure. Kevin Carroll is a national security law expert former senior official with the Department of Homeland Security and is with us now. All right, uh, again, if true, is what Milley did legal? Leland, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I think, as reported, uh, Chairman Milley had a good intention but the wrong execution. Uh, if he was concerned that President Trump was going to make an improvident use of a nuclear weapon, what he needed to do was encourage his civilian superiors, such as the acting Secretary of Defense, Christopher Miller, uh, Vice President Mike Pence, uh, to have the cabinet meet and consider under uh, uh, Section 4 of the 25th Amendment of the Constitution uh, to have the president declared unfit uh, to discharge the, the powers and duties of his office. Yeah, that's There's a constitutional procedure here that could have been followed. Yeah, we have no evidence that anybody in the cabinet ever met for the 25th Amendment. We're going to put up the chain of command because that's what this all comes down to. Obviously, the president is the commander in chief. Lawful orders go through him down to the secretary of defense. And it's, it's a little complicated here on the screen. But if you look at the little lines, they go over to the unified combatant commands, which is actually where nuclear weapons are launched from. The, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, as important as he is, does not sit in that chain of command. So help us parse when, if, in the best possible light for General Milley, when he said, I need to be on the net, what would that mean? So Leland, you're exactly right. Uh, the, the chain of command goes from the commander in chief to the secretary of defense to typically in this situation, uh, um, the strategic command commander, uh, or possibly one of the regional combatant commanders in Pacific Command or European Command, for example. Um, and, and they would have the, the launch authority delegated by the president, you know, ordered by the president. Now, every day, uh, the National Military Command Center practices nuclear warning and nuclear launch procedures. Um, and on a regular basis, there's a, uh, a communications test of all the senior officials, cabinet members, National Security mm. Council members, including the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who would advise the president uh, in the event of a nuclear crisis, if there was time uh, to, to have such a discussion. Interesting. So if, if Chairman Milley was just saying, remember, there's supposed to be a nuclear fires call with uh, certain NSC members, I'm supposed to be on it, that's exactly correct. If he was saying to the National Military Command Center, don't transmit an order from the President of the United States to the Commander of Strategic Command to launch a weapon, I think that was illegal. Uh, it it and, may have and, been and, and we, and we rightly point out, we, do, we don't know what was actually said. There's some reporting uh, that sources close to Milley are disputing this and saying that he simply said we need to follow procedure. It brings up, though, an important point of what happened in the days before this January 9th meeting, uh, which was Nancy Pelosi calling the chairman and saying, we must take the nuclear codes away from President Trump. How do we take the codes away? How do we make sure he doesn't launch a weapon? Uh, isn't that the Speaker of the House in a way doing something that's not really good about asking how to take power away from the president? I agree. The person that she needed to have that conversation with was Vice President Pence. Uh, yeah. She is the, the third in presidential succession. Um, and I think it would not be right to, to punch down to the uniform military and say, you have to take the responsibility of, of, of taking the, the biscuit, as it's called, with the nuclear launch codes um, and the football away from the president, real, but rather real quick, Kevin, go to the constitutional thir officer. I only got about 30 seconds. Uh, Colby had a bigger problem with the call with the Chinese than 
with the nuclear discussion. Doesn't that kind of, those kind of calls happen all the time, even between staunch enemies on the back channel, so to speak? There's calls all the time about deconfliction to make sure things that don't escalate. But saying that you would warn the Chinese in advance of an American attack uh, is is odd and unprecedented. And one of the things I think Senate Armed Services will want to get under oath about exactly what happened there. Yeah, exactly what the words were. And already we're, we're understanding that out of the Pentagon, there's some dispute in terms of exactly what uh, was said versus what was transcribed to the book. Kevin, uh, lots to talk about and lots to learn. Thank you. Thanks, Leland. All right. Well, those were troubles with the last administration, and there's some big troubles with this administration. As much as the White House wants Afghanistan to go, all, go away and move on, it's just not. The president's approval numbers continue to fall, and his national security team is taking a shellacking, especially the U.S. Secretary of State, who spent yesterday and today in front of congressional committees controlled by Democrats, which made it easier, but not by much. There is not enough lipstick in the world to uh, put on this pig to make it look any different than what it actually is. This wasn't a failure of intelligence. This was a failure of policy and planning. The guy the Biden administration droned, was he an aid worker or an ISIS-K operative? The administration is, of course, reviewing that, uh, that strike. Uh, and I'm sure that a you know, full assessment will be, will be forthcoming. So you don't know if it was an aid worker or an ISIS-K operative? Uh, I can't speak to that, and I can't speak to that in this setting in any event. So you don't know or won't tell us? Uh, I, don't, I don't know because we're, we're reviewing it. Well, see, you'd think you'd kind of know before you off somebody with a Predator drone whether he's an aid worker or he's an ISIS-K. Secretary Blinken, my office and other congressional offices have heard rumors regarding potential cabinet resignations over the situation in Afghanistan. So I want to ask you, have you submitted your resignation regarding this issue? I have not. The lack of accountability here, the lack of accountability in this administration is shocking to me. I want to ask you flat out, did the State Department give the Taliban a list or multiple lists of Americans and or Afghans that we wanted out? Those reports and the idea that we would do anything to endanger uh, our citizens or anyone else at a time when we were trying to save their lives is flat out wrong. Mr. Secretary, the execution of the U.S. withdrawal was clearly and fatally flawed. This committee expects to receive a full explanation of the administration's decisions on Afghanistan since coming into office last January. There has to be accountability. That last soundbite explains this graph. That was a Democratic senator who said that the administration's policies were fatally flawed. And President Biden's approval ratings have been falling steadily since the Taliban retook Kabul. And the bungled Afghanistan withdrawal evolving from a Republican talking point into this broader crisis as Democrats are trying to pivot and get President Biden a win. Joining us now to discuss what a win might look like, Washington Examiner senior political correspondent David Drucker. David, as always, good to see you. Uh, two days of hearings. Uh, you could say Anthony Blinken probably is having a martini right now, a well-deserved one. But did we actually learn anything new from all this good political theater? Not enough, uh, Leland. And, and I think that's the problem, particularly with the hearing in the House of Representatives yesterday, um, but even in the hearing today in the U.S. Senate, we just haven't gotten to the bottom of what was driving uh, the president's decision making, why they made the decisions they made. In particular, the president originally said, we're not leaving until we get every American and every one of our allies out. They clearly changed their mind. And it seems as though they either haven't figured out all of the answers or they're not any good. And so they're trying to dance around it. Hmm. And I think a lot of criticism is being heaped on Secretary of State Blinken. And that's fine. That's his job. But he and other top administration officials were carrying out the orders of the president. We just had a discussion about you, that. You've been, you've that's been, where the criticism belongs. Yeah. David, you've been in Washington for a, a long time. And yeah. If we if we look forward in this, does the resignations that were talked about or some kind of cabinet shakeup reset things for the Biden administration or not? Well, if the president decides that he needs to do something big, it could be a way for him to um, acknowledge culpability and mistakes and say that he's getting the message. 
you know, the last time we were facing calls for somebody's resignation on a grand scale, uh, I think we have to go back to the Iraq War when people were asking for Donald Rumsfeld's head, the late Donald Rumsfeld, who was the defense secretary, uh, Bush's first, George W. Bush's first defense secretary. And Bush refused to replace him until after the 06 elections because he didn't want it to look political. But people were calling for his head. But, you know, ultimately, they were carrying out the orders of the president. And if the president wanted them to, wanted them to change course, mm. they could have. That's a good point. And that is the, and that is the same thing here. So it, it is the kind of thing that sometimes voters demand and voters want. But at the end of the day, the pullout and the insistence on leaving August 31st without a full accounting of Americans, green card holders, and our Afghan allies in country okay. that wanted to get out, that needed to get out, falls on the shoulders of the president because he could have had it differently. We yeah, could have you, left forces you think in about Afghanistan. It though, David, okay, pr presidents don't resign over these things. The only person who's ever resigned uh, in recent memory is Richard Nixon. Uh, right. Josh Hawley, though, senator from Missouri, seems to say that he's going to insist that things change. Uh, for the Biden administration or extract some price. Take a listen. Let me be clear. I will not consent to the nomination of any nominee for the Department of Defense or for the Department of State until Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken and Jake Sullivan resign. Leaders take responsibility for their failures. Is that meaningful in Washington or a good soundbite for a political ad? 30 seconds. It's just a great soundbite for a political ad. I understand the frustration on the part of Republicans and Democrats on the Hill. Republicans have been more vocal than Democrats, but they are still frustrated. Yeah. But at the end of the day, nothing will change unless the president changes. Hmm. Uh, David, uh, you did it in under 30 seconds, and that's why we're going to have you back. One of the many reasons we will have you back. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Leland. All right. Quite literally, as we speak, Governor Gavin Newsom's fate is being decided in California. We're going to look at what they're saying about the black Republican candidate when we come back, what the media is saying. Plus, Facebook plays part in pretty much everything you do, and it's got you more hooked than you might think. New information about just how addictive Facebook is and how they play to our vulnerabilities. About 22 million teens log on to Instagram every single day. So most likely if you have a teenager or your grandkid is a teenager, they're doing it. It's parent company, Instagram's parent company, Facebook, has already been caught stealing people's data. Now it's been caught lying in public about its app's effects on teen users. Here's the Wall Street Journal reporting. The social media giant is well aware that Instagram is toxic to teenagers, most notably teenage girls. Social media giant conducted a three-year study into the photo sharing app's effects on teens. One in five reported that Instagram made them feel worse about themselves. More than 40% of users reported feeling unattractive when they started to use the app. 6% of teens with suicidal thoughts traced those desires back to the app. Rob Lockwood's a privacy advocate and media strategist in Washington with us. Rob, we appreciate it. All right. Uh, sad to think that Facebook is continuing to do this and prey upon and make money from teenagers, but should we be surprised? Uh, no, not at all. This is tremendous reporting from the Wall Street Journal, primary source material, but it tells us what we've already known for a long time, people who study this, it's that Facebook has a scumbag business model, and this proves that they know they do as well. This is a problem for Facebook, because this report is about Instagram, which is a much more popular brand that they own than Facebook itself. And so as Facebook, which is now valued as a trillion dollar company, looks to the future, they know that the Facebook you and I, which we were first users from, that's not the future. They hope that Instagram is. And hmm. so when you see reports about how Instagram is leading to demoralizations and anxiety, it's a huge problem for them. What I thought was most interesting is, is it's one thing to make a product and not know it's bad for people. Uh, you almost think about like a cigarette company. They didn't know cigarettes were uh, initially causing cancer. But it's another thing to make a product, know that it's bad for people, know that it's mm -hmm. bad for teenagers, and then work to continue to make it more addictive, which is at least how I read the Wall Street Journal article. Did I get anything wrong? No, that's right. And so when you talk about Facebook or Instagram, you have to understand what it is. And from my perspective, Facebook is a surveillance agency. 
that sells advertising against you, that filters information and feeds you information because they know everything about you. They know where you are, they know who you're talking to, and they know what you think because people are constantly liking and commenting on posts all day. And so their model is to serve an addictive information platform, communication so that you're constantly doing those things which they're monitoring and again, feeding you that information. So their whole goal is to keep you addicted. And when you constantly get people to react and respond to every waking thought and image that their friends have, you're gonna breed insanity. And that's part of what they've done here. You talk about addiction, which you know actually has a chemical uh, component to it. Uh, this is reporting from Axios all the way back in 2017. We need to sort of give a, you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or post or whatever. This is uh, Sean Parker, who was one of the co-founders of Facebook. And that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you more likes and comments. So it seems though you, you hook a kid early, they just keep going down the rabbit hole. Yeah, so I'm familiar with the Sean Parker quote. In it, he talks about how they were exploiting its uh, vulnerability in human psychology. They, and that's something that a hacker like him could do. He says that they knew what they were doing at the time and did it anyways. And he says, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. These documents from the Wall Street Journal show, not only does, has God always known what it's done to our children's brains, so did Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg. And so to understand the danger of Facebook, you have to hear how Sean talks about it. He's talking about it as a drug. It plays back to what I was talking about in surveillance. The whole thing he's saying is like more, comment more. And the more you do that, the more time you spend and the more information you give Facebook. And that's why people's timelines are flooded with things that they're more likely to engage with. And when you look at Instagram specifically, it used to be, I would follow you, you would follow me. And we'd only see what our people in our network- And now, and now suddenly- now. And now suddenly we both get a whole lot of ads for golf training devices that are going to help our game. Yeah, it's helped you more than me, clearly. But uh, <laughs> more importantly, so what they've built out is that it used to have a limited function. It was only people in your network. Now, Instagram, if you scroll through it, it's posts you may like. And it's all weird. A lot wow. of it is political. Some of it's relevant. Some of it's not. But the whole thing is engagement. And when you look at Instagram and Facebook, so much of this culture is fake. It's built on envy and competition. And that is hacking human psychology. Yeah, and that's and you've seen stories over the years, Leland. We've I know what, uh, it seems as though that's what exactly what these young women are responding to uh, in, in this in terms of sort of creating this culture of envy or uh, perfection. Rob, we got to leave it there. Thank you. We'll have you back to talk about how to Hold Facebook accountable. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All right. Well, President Biden spent the day drumming up support for his massive climate change initiatives. That includes parts of the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill that is currently quite literally on life support in the Senate. We're negotiating right now for my plan to build back better, which includes additional action to address climate crisis. But we face a crisis with an unprecedented opportunity to create good jobs in the future, create industries of the future, to win the future, to save the planet. So far, his trip to California, Oregon, and California has not changed the state of play in the Senate, and it hasn't placated progressives either, who say they will hold some of the president's other priorities hostage till they get what they want. For matters like this, we bring in Pablo Manriquez, the Capitol correspondent for Latino Rebels. Pablo, appreciate it as always. Uh, how Thanks desperate me, right now is the White House, and what are you hearing they're offering uh, progressives on Capitol Hill to try to get a deal done? It's really hard to read whether what, where the deal is right now on Capitol Hill with regards to the, the energy components, because obviously Joe Manchin has, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia has torpedoed the clean energy, the clean electricity part of the larger energy part of the budget reconciliation. But the House and the, lo and, the, and the lower chamber went ahead and marked it up anyway. So you have a case where a very powerful senator vying for political power right. is saying, no, we're not going to do it. But in the House, they're like, we're just going to ignore you and move forward anyway. Yeah, you've, you've so the, it's unclear. You've got a very powerful senator, right, in, in Joe Manchin. You've also got a very powerful caucus in the, in the progressives who you cover uh, in the House uh, up there on Capitol Hill. How empowered are they right now? 
They're very empowered. They're very empowered after the uh, the ability to force the White House's hand into extending the eviction moratorium. Now, if the eviction moratorium was a big topic to them, green energy is like the topic to them. AO, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez obviously has her very famous Green New Deal, but this is something that I feel like is a, is a hill for them to die on. Uh, I think that one of the things that you're going to see is they're going to start sort of painting Joe Manchin as a Exxon lobbyist in a senator's yeah, costume, already, well, which yeah. has been sort of their 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 play so far. But it's hard to say if whether or not they're because basically, if you think about it this way, as important as Joe Manchin's vote is in the budget reconciliation, this core group of progressive House members, squad members, are just as important as Joe Manchin if you want to pass the bill. Nancy, if you, yeah, if you, if you want to have, pass the one trillion dollar thing, it, something's got to give on one side. You have to you have to have a deal. Uh, this caught the eye, certainly, of conservative media um, and even sort of centrist media, which was the picture of uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, at the Met Gala. Uh, the back of her dress says, tax the rich. Um, the hypocrisy in this is a little rich, but I'm one fair or it just doesn't matter anymore. I don't think it matters anymore. Yeah. I think that after the Trump era, I think that entertainment and politics is kind of melded. I mean, politics is sort of like the new pop culture. And I think that Alexandria Ocasio, being a New Yorker, being sort of in the center of what is both politics and pop culture and news media universe, uh, I think that she's sort of embracing it. So I think that the one thing that, um, you know, AOC and other and other members of Congress, other members of the federal yeah. government that want to participate in things like the Met Gala need to worry about more so than just the optics is the actual ethics. Uh, if they if they take wait, like now, if they now, take wait, home hold the, on hold on hold on you know hypocrisy was went out in the Trump era ethics went out a long time ago in Washington Pablo well, you're dating I, yourself I, my I, friend <laughs> dare to dream we got to run well, I, mean the, I, I mean the ethics committee so <laughs> she could get in trouble with the ethics committee for if she if if she accepted gifts oh, okay, whether it's enough. a gift bag or a dress or anything like that she could be in deep trouble and mm -hmm. it looks like Elise Stefanik on the Republican side of things is going to be coming after her for that wow all right well uh, when that happens if it happens come back and talk to us about it all right Right. We'll watch your reporting. Thank you, Leland. Thanks. Good to see you. All right. Voters are right now at the polls in California. Today's recall election might be telling us something about COVID politics. Plus, the media accused of going low in their attacks on GOP candidate Larry Elder. What's with playing the race card against Larry Elder when we come back? Losers. I mean, they, they, these poor little snowflakes are going around every time it looks like they're going to lose an election. They, they say, oh, the election got stolen. They cheated. I mean, seriously, this is this is this is elemental. That's MSNBC's Joe Scarborough today ripping Republicans and GOP candidate Larry Elder for alleging voter fraud even before today's California election recall raising questions over whether this is the new Republican playbook when it comes to elections they fear they may lose. Former President Trump also joined in saying, quote, does anybody really believe the California election isn't rigged? Millions and millions of mail-in ballots make this just another giant election scam. Again, this is President Trump talking about the California recall election taking place right now. No different, President Trump said, but less blatant than the 2020 presidential election election scam. We're going to talk about all that in just a minute. But the polls in California in recent days have shown Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom, well, pretty comfortably ahead. San Francisco Chronicle, though, had an editorial warning, think Newsom has recall in the bag, don't be so sure, pointing out the polls have been wrong before and that turn in from mail-in ballots has been, in their words, measly so far. There are some signs that the race might be closer than we think. Top Democrats have been jetting in to try and turn out the vote for Governor Newsom. President Biden yesterday campaigning for Newsom, where he took aim at GOP leader Larry Elder, trying to paint him as simply a holdover, a clone, you might say, a former President Trump. And that's kind of what Democrats are banking in on California, trying to make this election a referendum on Larry Elder and his views, not a referendum on Gov Governor, Governor Newsom and the slew of crises that exists under him from homelessness to rising crime in California. If elected, Elder would be California's first black governor, a fact you would think the media would champion. champion. But no, the Los Angeles Times column rails against Elder and the, quote, danger of the model minority candidate alleging Elder comforts 
the, quote, most racist far-right wings of the GOP. And another Los Angeles Times column actually calling Elder the, quote, black face of white supremacy. Joining us now, Robert Patillo, civil rights attorney and radio show host, Heard Worldwide. Robert, appreciate you taking time in the evening before your morning radio show. Uh, I didn't think you were supposed to play the race card in 2021, were you? You know, it's amazing to me because what we see in many elections, particularly when uh, when, uh, when there's a black Republican on the ballot, uh, is that there's almost a ownership class of the black vote um, that we see with many white liberals. I'm not by any uh, any circumstance a Larry Elder supporter. He said very incendiary and insane things in the past. But if you look at Larry Elders in California, Tim Scott in South Carolina, here in Georgia, we have both uh, Herschel Walker and Kelvin King uh, running as well as Vernon Jones running for governor. Uh, it seemed to me that many white Liberals think they own the black vote. If anybody steps away from that, if anybody has any questions about that, they feel that it is their responsibility to step in and mm -hmm. quote unquote play the race card on behalf of the black community uh, instead of simply standing up and saying what they have done and why they, they are the better candidates for that community. You point out this double standard with black conservatives. Why is a double standard with black conservatives acceptable? I don't think that it is. I, I think that often when you're when you're seeing the, uh, this is a new phenomenon for many people. Um, that back in you know, 10, 20 years ago, you'll see an Alan Keyes or a J.C. Watts every once in a while. But there's now a new concentration of particularly black male conservatives who are running nationwide. Uh, and in many cases, the uh, the liberal media really does not have a, a concept of how do you run against that person. Um, you have a Republican, so you want to call them racist, but they're black, so it's hard to do. So they end up almost contorting themselves uh, into this positioning. I think that. Instead of doing that, they can simply concentrate and just focus on what has Gavin Newsom done for black voters in California. Just run on that if you have a good record on it, instead of trying to attack someone like Larry Elders, who has done plenty of things to get attacked on. I'm not, I'm not defending him, but what I'm saying is that black voters are tired of this because it's all the same thing to 2020 so they, This sort of comes down to the question, people do this because they think it works. Mm -hmm. Here's Gavin Newsom doing just what you were describing. Take a listen. The idea they're even playing around with this and vandalizing trust and confidence, that's consequential and it has real impact across this country. And I'll tell you what, the irony of it, and it really is the irony, it's going to hurt the Republican Party because they're telling their voters their vote doesn't, doesn't even matter. So it's a hell of a thing. Another uh, thing, I won't use the exact words that he used, was the white woman who threw an egg at Larry Elder wearing a gorilla suit. Uh, if that had been a white Trump supporter throwing an egg at a black Democrat, I think we would have been talking about it a lot more, don't you? Absolutely. And I think often we see that, uh, I'll give you an example. Often we see these Karen attacks in the media, you know, the quote unquote Karens who are, uh, I'm going to call the manager, attacking a, uh, or calling police on a black family for doing nothing. Very rarely are they the, the stereotype of a MAGA hat wearing, Confederate flag flying, uh, you know, uh, Southern conservative Republican. It's usually a well to do upper middle class person who does not understand their own privilege and their relationship to white supremacy. So if you're wearing a gorilla mask and throwing an egg at a black man, you may want to reevaluate whether or not you are a white supremacist, regardless of what you voted on in the last election. And very often, these people see the black vote as simply a pawn to their own political ends. It's not about actually doing the things that are best for the black community. It's about simply getting their vote to push their own agenda. Well, the polls close in California in a couple of hours. We're going to get the uh, exit poll results, and uh, that'll tell us a lot about whether the, the strategy you just described worked. Robert, thank you. Thanks so much. Anytime. All right. Well, California is also telling us a lot about COVID politics. President Biden yesterday suggested Governor Gavin Newsom's COVID restrictions are popular with voters as they look to tie Elder to former President Trump and GOP governors who also opposed mask mandates. Take a listen. You either keep Gavin Newsom as your governor <coughs> or you'll get Donald Trump. It's not a joke. Republican governor blocking progress on COVID-19. All right, so that's how Democrats are playing this. But today's recall also is giving us hints on Republican strategy heading into the midterms. Kristen Soltis Anderson, pollster and columnist at the Washington Examiner with us now. Kristen, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, how much of this, where's the middle stand on this? Do they side with the lockdowns or the freedom that Larry Elder promises. 
The middle in our politics these days says you should get vaccinated, you should wear masks if you're going to be in close proximity to a lot of other people indoors for a long period of time, but you shouldn't be closing down businesses. We need to have kids back in school. And so it's it's sort of in between where we find the extremes. Um, but it's a belief that we shouldn't be shutting down businesses, we shouldn't be crippling our economy, because now we have a great vaccine. We have the tools, we have the knowledge about this virus, so we don't need to do that anymore. What got Governor Newsom into trouble and the reason why he's, this recall effort even got started was because of the hypocrisy we saw from him earlier in the pandemic with these really tough lockdowns you saw in California paired with things like him going to fancy restaurants, the French Laundry, palling around with you know, lobbyists and such while everybody else had to stay home. It's that hypocrisy that even folks in the middle who are supportive of making sure that we're doing everything we can to combat the virus, they go, well, wait a minute, why is it restrictions for thee but not for me coming from politicians? And it's important to note what's happened with the poll numbers here because uh, eight, eight, 10 weeks ago, it really looked like Gavin Newsom might be getting the boot. And now he's really widened this margin out uh, almost, we shouldn't say on election day, but to a wide double digit margin, depending on what poll you believe that he'll stay. Uh, Larry Elder, who is the leading candidate to take over if he does get the boot, said this. Take a listen. So many people are going to vote yes on the recall. There won't be any question about the outcome. I just hope my opponent is willing to accept the results when he loses. Okay, so in the last 12 hours, the talking points flipped on their head. Why? Well, you always want to project confidence as a candidate. You want your supporters to feel like you've got a real shot here. And for many weeks, Larry Elder really did have a shot. You know, there were some polls out there that showed this was going to be a tough one for Governor Newsom. In some ways, the best thing Democrats could have ever hoped for would have been those scary poll numbers a couple of weeks ago because it woke California Democrats up to the reality that Newsom was on the ropes. Um, California is an extremely blue state. If you look at the party registration there, about 47 percent of Californians are registered as Democrats. It's 20 points lower for Republicans. You've got about as many independents as you have Republicans. Most of that state is Democratic, so you would think a Democratic governor ought to be in great shape. But if there's no enthusiasm enthusiasm on the Democratic side, but Republicans feel like they have a chance. That was the dynamic we were looking at a few weeks ago. Hmm. It may be that Democrats got a gift in those scary poll numbers. They realized in time they had to turn out their base. And that's why you're seeing folks like the president coming out there and stumping for Newsom. Yeah, well, there's a lot of enthusiasm for somebody because there's lines out, out every door in polling places when we see uh, live shots from out there. Kristen, thank you as always. Thank yeah, you. Great conversation. Five for Fighting's lead singers released a new song ripping President Biden's disastrous Afghanistan withdraw ahead. He's going to tell you what inspired him to write it and what he thinks the liberals might do to him for recording it. And I don't understand. Out on these hands. Still Americans left her the Taliban. Now, how's that happening? Just a few lines of the new Five for Fighting song, Blood on My Hands, which criticizes President Biden for the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The song was written after the suicide bombing in Kabul less than three weeks ago. Hard to imagine it's been that long. Just killed 13 Americans. You might recognize the voice. It's that of John Andrasnik, better known as Five for Fighting. He performed dozens of USO shows for troops overseas. Also wrote Superman, which was widely dubbed the 9-11 anthem. Joins us now. Uh, John, appreciate it. You wrote the 9-11 anthem, as I understood it, before 9-11, so that wasn't political. This overtly political. Why the statement? You know, Leland, as you, as you said, when our 13 soldiers were killed, I was angry and frustrated and did what songwriters do. I went to my piano and I banged out some chords, and I wasn't planning on writing a song, but really what triggered the song was a few days after uh, our last soldier left Afghanistan, I got a call from a friend. And she said, hey, I'm, I'm organizing evacuations from Afghanistan. Uh, we got AMSITs, I didn't even know what that was, American citizens, SIV holders, and can you connect some dots for me? And I thought to myself, are we really in a world 
where private citizens have to go rescue our people that our government left behind. And to me, uh, this is not a political song. It's a moral song. It's humanitarian mm -hmm. crisis. I understand it'll be taken as one, but I thought somebody had to say it and somebody had to hold our leadership okay. accountable. And I'll tell you, I would have written the same song if Donald Trump was president, only the names would change. All right, fair, fair enough. That said, Donald Trump isn't president. Joe Biden is. You live in yep. Los Angeles. You're part of the music community. Very successful. Multiple number ones. Uh, do you worry at all about the blowback that's going to happen from criticizing a Democratic president? You know it's coming. Yeah, you know, I think, I think for the most part, they're trying to just ignore it because they don't want Afghanistan in the news. Um, I hope they don't. Sometimes a song can make a statement that uh, other things other things don't. And uh, I really uh, I really don't care. You know, the, the, I have I'm hearing horror stories happening to women and children on the ground that I wish I could talk about, but I don't want to like give any clues to the bad guys. Yeah. But they're all going to come out, and you're seeing them now. You're seeing the beheadings. It's too important. We put those people in that situation. We broke our promise. It's our obligation to hold our leaders accountable and do what we can for them. And I don't see that happening. Well, uh, do, doing that at your own peril, which you're doing, uh, takes a lot of moral courage, which is something lacking in this world right now. Uh, we admire you, John. We appreciate it. And uh, we're going to have you back. Thank you. Uh, when we come back, some nice thoughts about one of those that was killed in Kabul. We want to introduce you to a very special American. Marine Riley McCollum was one of the 13 service members killed in the bombing at the Kabul airport just three weeks before his baby girl came into the world. And here she is, Levi Riley Rose McCollum, was born yesterday at Camp Pendleton in California. Jim McCollum, the fallen Marine's father, wrote a poem to celebrate her arrival, writing, Levi Riley Rose, I love you, little girl. You blessed us all with light and love when you came into the world. Hold on to your mama. She's needing you right now. You're precious. You're beautiful. You brought the world together somehow. Your daddy, he's watching over you, loves you both so much. The worst of times brings out the best in Americans, collectively donating nearly a million dollars for Levi Riley Rose. Prime's next.